I'm super thrilled to welcome our first day two speaker. Uh, I'm sure many of you know him. He's the Dean of Computer Science at Khan Academy and the creator of the jQuery JavaScript library, which I'm pretty sure changed the way we program things on the web. Uh, he's also the author of several amazing JavaScript books uh, and an instrumental member of the, the whole JavaScript community and, and a personal inspiration to me for many years. Uh, and, and I'm and all of us are very excited to hear about some of his recent adventures. Uh, so please give a big, big warm welcome to John Resig. So I, I'm, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk about some of the work that I've been doing. Um, and it's, it's interesting because it's, it's, very, it's, it's very data, uh, but in, in my case, uh, you know, I'm doing lots of work with art, which is one of my passions, and especially with uh, uh, Japanese art. And this is something that started for me personally maybe about five years ago or so, and it's kind of been growing and growing. And uh, as it's been growing, I've been trying to reconcile sort of my interest in this and my interest in obviously technology and programming and trying to find ways to make them work together. I think I've been pretty successful, so I wanted to talk a little bit about like how this all fits together. I wanted to start with a super, super quick uh, basic primer on the type of Japanese art that I'm really into. Uh, uh, just a, a, a quick intro. So that I, I, I assume everyone recognizes this image. Uh, it's an incredibly famous, in this case, a Japanese print, uh, uh, The Great Wave by uh, Hokusai. And um, so this print came from a time in Japan from uh, the 1600s to the mid 1800s. And this is a time of actually great peace in Japan uh, and great prosperity. Uh, everyone was uh, making lots of money and people were, as a result, uh, 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 wanting to buy art and acquire it for themselves. And uh, this is actually a map here of Tokyo, then called Edo, uh, from 1850 or so. And I, I love these maps. So one of the things I'll, I'll point out, given the, given the crowd here, so you see like the little crest there with a couple leaves in it. And there's also all these total, tiny little red circles. Those are actually the family crests of the daimyo, so like the, the, the feudal lords. Uh, so what, what actually happened is that giant one there in the center, that's the shogun, that's his palace. That's still there in, in, in Tokyo. And all around it are, the, uh, uh, are all his favorite lords. And he physically positioned them close, to, he, he positioned the people he liked the best closest to him. So you can actually plot out the distance from the shogun's main castle to everyone else uh, and, and, and get a plot of like how in favor they were with the shogun. Uh, so you, you can see some circles way out there at the edge and like they obviously did not like them at all. Um, totally anecdot anecdotal, I could go on about this stuff forever. Um, so, this art form, it's called uh, ukiyo-e, uh, Pictures of the Floating World. And, and what it is, is so it's, it's, it's woodblock printing. It, you, ha you have a piece of wood, uh, uh, you carve an image into it, you, you put some paper onto it with ink, and you're, you're, doing, you're creating all these uh, images. But what's interesting about this is that you have artists who are doing this, and the artists are completely decoupled from this process. So, so like that, that initial design I showed you here right, with the Great Wave. So Hokusai, he designed this image. He, he, you know, he, he drew up a, a, a picture, he, but then that was commissioned by a publisher. He did not carve it or print it or, uh, or any of that himself. So the publisher actually paid him you know, a small amount of money and went to the publisher. The publisher then contracted out to woodblock printers and woodblock carvers and did that all themselves. And this is actually kind of like how copyright was managed during this time. Whoever owned the physical wood block that the image was carved into owned the print. Um, so just an example here, so this is, one of, there, was, there were a couple of types of imagery that were very, very common during this time frame. Uh, one of the most common was pictures of beautiful women and courtesans. Um, so uh, one of the reasons for this is that, uh, uh, so I showed the picture of Tokyo earlier. What, the, what happened in Tokyo is that the, uh, when, the, when the shogun came into power in the early 1600s, he demanded that every single feudal lord, no matter where they were in Japan, had to come and live every other year inside the, the capital. And as a result, so like you have all these lords who are coming and bringing all their samurai and all their retainers and everyone and marching, literally marching to, uh, to Tokyo. 
building up their, their residencies, you can see here. And what happens as a result is that you have, Tokyo goes from a tiny little fishing village to like a massive million person city. And like, you know, in the, in the course of just decades. Um, but one of the things that happens as a result is that there are lots and lots and lots of bored samurai who have nothing better to do. And one of the things that happens as a result is that you, you have, for example, lots of courtesans and lots of beautiful ladies, and people love these imagery. Uh, so like, um, I just want to show a couple of examples. Uh, this is a, a courtesan here in a, in a procession with other uh, courtesans. Uh, another piece of imagery that was super popular was depictions of kabuki theater. Uh, so kabuki in the day, uh, there, were, there were three main kabuki theaters in Japan, and everyone, it, you would go there, and it was a major, major event. You would go early in the morning, uh, you would have you know, like, a, like a box you would sit in with your friends, you would eat food. It was much more uh, raucous than your typical theater performance. Uh, people would be shouting and talking, and like whenever their favorite actors came on, uh, they would they would shout out that person's name and like it was like all the actors had fan clubs as well like people would be waving banners and it was like a super intense event uh, it's sort of like a sporting event meets meets theater um, and as a result these these actors were super super popular um, I don't know what the best analogy is but they're kind of like. I'd say they're, they're sort of like you know the Brad Pitt of the day, where, where like everyone knows who who these people are unquestionably, and so like people would buy the prints depicting them because then you get to see your favorite actors, and and, and you'll have this memento and, and re remember them and all this stuff. So yeah, so there's you you end up with all sorts of just really uh, uh, really interesting uh, dynamics there, and I love some of the costumes as well. It's just it's just absolutely fantastic. Um, another uh, common source of imagery was depictions of warriors and, and sort of myth. So this is coming from a, a Chinese tale here. And here you have a warrior. Uh, I, I love the tattoo on his chest and stomach. So this is done by an artist named uh, Kuniyoshi. And if you ever see those like uh, what the, the Yakuza mob and they have like the crazy full body tattoos and stuff, that comes from Kuniyoshi's tattoos that he designed in prints. So they're cribbing off of that, which he, he, he invented. Um, and then you also have you know, you know, like sumo wrestlers, sumo wrestling was still a thing. And of course you have depictions of nature. So uh, uh, it sort of the, the great wave. One thing that people sometimes don't notice is that you have, you know, have this giant wave, you have the little boats uh, in, inside there. People, they actually see people hanging onto the boats or being tossed around, hanging on for their dear lives. And way back, uh, tucked in there is, is the uh, Mount Fuji, uh, way in the back. And so this is actually from the series 36 Views of Mount Fuji. And every single print in this series has a different depiction of Mount Fuji. Now granted, in this one, it's incredibly understated. It looks like a wave, obviously, intentionally. Um, uh, and then you, you have all these other depictions of, of nature, you know, fish and all sorts of stuff. So I just want to bring up a couple really, I think, crazy prints, because I really like them, uh, just to get you kind of interested. So this one here. Uh, so this, uh, it's, you, everyone can see, you know, it's cats. Yeah, you have all these cats. Um, and so I'll, I'll totally say, Japan was weird before it was currently weird. Um, and, uh, you, so these are all cats. That, you know, they're dressed up in, in kimonos, um, and they also have incredibly distinctive faces. Like looking at them, you know, they look more human-like than they do cat-like. Um, and this was created very, during a very, very particular time in Japan, uh, uh, early 1840s. And the reason why uh, uh, this print exists is that whoever was in power at that time actually made it illegal to depict uh, kabuki actors and prints. And so one of the ways around it was having a whole bunch of just cool cats who happen to dress, like to dress in kimonos who just so happen to have faces that look a lot like kabuki actors. So the thing is, is that like people, people who knew the kabuki actors and knew them from the, the plays and other prints could look at these and be like, oh, that's Ichikawa Danjuro. And like you can tell by the way the face looks, but it's actually a cat here and this is great. And so like this is, um, so this is a way to subvert censorship uh, during this time. And people really liked 
uh, uh, really like this. It was interesting is that even after the censorship was lifted, p these sort of prints were still made because people were sort of like the puzzle of figuring out who was being depicted. This is another one. Uh, so, you, so you have a, a, a face there. I just want to zoom in a little bit. Uh, so if you look at the face, the face is actually, you can tell it's made up of bodies. So there's like little, there's, you know, like the nose is a body and the ear is a body and like the head is made up of a couple bodies. And just to zoom in a little m more, uh, you have here a, a cloaked, it's actually a catfish um, shooting like lasers, <laughs> all right? Um, and just to kind of unravel what's going on here, because again, this is, what, this is one of the things I really like about this art form is that there is so much particular imagery and there's so much to learn. I feel like I will never, ever learn it all. Um, but this particular one, this is a depiction of an earthquake. And the, the reason why is what you have here, so th this, this was, there was a major earthquake in, in Tokyo and the face is made up of the bodies of the people who died. And the cloak uh, that he's wearing, you see there's patterns, there's like wood and tools and all sorts of repair supplies from the, where they're rebuilding uh, uh, after the earthquake. And the catfish is actually the depiction of the earthquake itself. In Japan, catfish were commonly associated with earthquakes. Um, now, the reason why there is this very weird imagery is that it was actually illegal to do any depictions of current events. Uh, during this time. So you would end up with this, again, very particular imagery that is actually talking about the thing that just happened in Tokyo, but it's not talking about it. So the, 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 again, like there are all these ways to sort of subvert the government and try to get around these restrictions. Okay, so I just I wanted to bring those up just to kind of give you a, a quick taste. And so to kind of dive into my, my interest and, and my, my sort of problem is that, so here we have uh, a, a whole bunch of woodblock prints. These are much, much later, 1890s or so. And uh, sometimes prints like this come up at, at auction, uh, uh, come up for sale in this case. There's Lot 55, 20 Japanese woodblock prints, each depicting a female slash geisha figure with calligraphy throughout the, each print. Now what's interesting is that many auction houses don't have the staff or the ability to figure out what they have. Uh, I think a lot of people respect auction houses as sort of an, an authority figure. Some of them are, most of them are not. And uh, so one thing that happens is that you end up with this, where you have a giant lot of prints, and they have literally no idea what it is. They've correctly guessed that it's Japanese, good for them, and that it's depicting female figures. Uh, and other than that, they have no idea what it is. They estimate it at $400 to $600. So the problem then becomes is that you know, if they have no idea what it is, how do you, as a layperson, figure out what it is? And in my case, one of the things that I've done is you have to acquire and read lots and lots of expensive books. Um, n almost none of these books are cheap. Uh, like, I, th I think the, the most I've ever, ever paid for a book per page was a dollar per page. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, this is actually pretty common. It's just, it's just like, absolutely ridiculous. Um, and it's, so like, this is just some samples from my bookshelf of all the different uh, uh, books I've just bought and read and read and read to try and understand uh, this art form in the time period. Um, and of course, the, a big part of this is that you have to learn how to read Japanese. Now, the, the asterisk here is that you need to learn to read Japanese from the 17th and 19th century. <laughs> This is very, very different from current Japanese. You just can't hop on Duolingo and be like, all right, let's learn some Japanese. It is completely different. What, what people will speak now, what they refer to now, and, the, and how they write it now is completely different. And of course, yeah, so yeah, you're not gonna learn this from Rosetta Stone. And on top of this, you have to be able to learn to read Japanese calligraphy. And this is the sort of thing that really only experts can do, like, like postdoctoral, like they've spent their whole, like they, you know, like, it's interesting, like, you know, I sometimes go to Japanese lectures, and even within the lecture of all these experts, there's only like one or two people in the audience who can actually like translate like Japanese poems and stuff, and, like read it and translate it. Um, so it's incredibly hard skilled. I, I, so I've kind of chalked this up to be like, I am never gonna do this, ever. It is not worth my time. Um, Whereas, like, like, I can use technology to work around a lot of this. And so I built this website called uh, ukiyoe.org. And 
Uh, I also have woodblog.org and a bunch of other domain names. Um, but the, uh, so what this website is, is it's a, a, an aggregation of Japanese woodblock prints from many different museums, uh, uh, universities, auction houses, dealers, um, anyone. Uh, uh, and I pull in all these images of prints into a single unified database. And I put it up online, and I make it really, really fast. Um, I also uh, completely index uh, all the text, so that way you can search for cat and get all these awesome prints that depict cats. Um, and I also internationalize everything, uh, so that you can actually search the website in both English and Japanese and get back listings in English and Japanese. So I actually take Japanese uh, databases and translate them to English, English tra uh, databases and translate them to Japanese, which is really, really hard. I'll get into that. Um, so yeah, so like here's the uh, Japanese version of the website. I can't currently read or speak Japanese, uh, so I do a lot of cheating. Um, so w one, one quick tip, if you want to uh, internationalize uh, like certain aspects of your UI, uh, like, like for example here, there's a, a button that says search, essentially. And I'm like, because there's many, you can put in the Google Translate and get back different ways to translate that, but not all of them mean like search, you know, from this text field kind of, you know, affordance. And like, so I, I was like, well, who has a search button? I bet Google has a search button. And you go to Google and you see what's on their search button on, on Google dot, uh, you know, uh, on, on the Google Japanese uh, site, and you copy the text and you bring it over, and you can cheat pretty far with that. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing I'll note is that actually the Japanese version of the site is uh, more pop. It, it, right now, the popular site is is number one in Japan, then Europe, then the U.S. currently, which is a, it's, again it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, so I want to talk a lot about. I'm gonna as I go through the talk, here, I'm gonna talk about different modules and pieces of code that I've written. Uh, virtually everything I've written is open source and up in my GitHub account. Uh, so like I've written a node module for doing uh, easy uh, string substitution and so that you can uh, easily translate strings. Uh, so for example, you end up with sort of this map between an English version of the string and, the, and a, in my case, the Japanese version. And you can, you can port this to multiple languages. And this is really easy to pass to a translator. You can be like, here, here's this JSON file. Just you know, type in all the strings and you're done. The architecture of the site. Um, so this is uh, how it currently is. I'm posting the main site um, on DigitalOcean, and I'm using Node for, for a lot of this. And uh, I'm storing most of the data in MongoDB, and I'm storing the search stuff in Elasticsearch. Uh, one of the big things that was really important to me was making sure that, all, that the site was going to load very quickly for those uh, who weren't in the US. So part of that was that I put all the images up onto Amazon CloudFront, which is a CDN. If you're not familiar with what a CDN is, a, a content distribution network. So these are servers that are positioned all over the globe. Uh, and in case of Amazon CloudFront, they have servers in, in Japan, in Europe, in the US. And you can put your images onto there, and it'll load very, very quickly. Um, so again, like I wanted to make sure the site was going to be very, very fast, no matter where uh, you were. OK, so one of the things I, I've also built is that you, so you see these little images down here. So like, uh, the images at the bottom are uh, uh, representative images of a particular artist. Now, one of the features that I added was uh, uh, this ability to, you can hover over an, uh, an artist and scrub through uh, prints that they've created. Because the thing is, is that like, it's really hard to get, I, f I feel like it's really hard to get a sense for uh, an artist's total work, because they, you know, it, it oftentimes spans many, many decades, many, many different pieces of subject matter, and so I just wanted to show that again. So the, again, you can, you can, uh, I, I made this plugin so you can move your mouse over and just quickly just scrub through and see, and you're like, oh, okay, I got a pretty good idea what this person makes. There's some nature stuff. There's some birds. There's a lot of landscapes. I've got it. You know, like, and you can, and like, that's something that you can tell in a matter of seconds, as opposed to you know having to click through the page, look through the results, and you know, like all this sort of stuff. So I made that as a jQuery plugin, and that's available online. So one of the big problems with this is, <laughs> you know, I'm aggregating from all these institutions, and I currently have about a quarter million images of prints. 
Um, so I, I'm by far the largest public database of Japanese woodlot prints online. Um, one of the challenges with collecting all this information is that uh, it's really, really hard to do. Obviously, you know, this is, you're getting into scraping. Um, uh, now, one of the problems here is that many different uh, uh, museums and institutions and universities don't have the best websites. Um, this is incredibly common. Um, I mean, at this point, like I'm, I'm perfectly content scraping websites that are nothing but tables. I'm so used to it. I'm like, oh, tables and font tags. Here we go. And like, but like the, uh, at least their website works. Uh, and that seems to be a pretty large hurdle. Um, so like I wrote this particular scraping framework. And what it does is it works in a very, I think, unique way, which is it's designed to be able to easily navigate like search result pages. And so what you can do is you, you go to a page of search results, and it goes to, it behaves like a human. It's actually using a, a Phantom JS, which is a headless WebKit. So it's, it, you have a, a, a copy of WebKit, uh, uh, which we you know, use in Safari and Chrome, in the background, and it's actually doing things like click, it, it clicks a link, it navigates that page, looks through the page, hits the back button, goes back, and this is what it's doing. It's going to the search result page, clicking, uh, 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 downloading that page, going back, and it keeps doing this over and over again. So it's literally behaving like a human would. Uh, uh, and this is important because a lot of these websites only really work in this way. And it also completely works even if uh, the website is you know, rendered with JavaScript or, or what have you. So it ends up with this giant pipeline. So, so I just I want to show this because it, it ends up being uh, kind of crazy. So you end up going to this website, and it's going through WebKit and PhantomJS. I use these other libraries to interact it, uh, with it from Node. I take the data, I save it, dump it out the XML files and into a MongoDB log, process it, turn it, uh, uh, process the data, put it back into MongoDB, and in, uh, the end result here is I end up with all these sort of uh, uh, chunks of data that are representing like images and artists. Um, just to show you an example of a module here, uh, so this is actually a little scraper script uh, that I wrote, and one of the things I do to test is I actually scrape my own website just to make as a sanity check to make sure that it's working correctly. But this is the entire script, and it's capable of scraping all the data off my website uh, uh, in, in with just these mm, seven lines or so. Uh, just to kind of give an example of the kind of content that would come out, uh, there's you know this is like an example chunk of data that would come out of a web page, nicely formatted uh, JSON and uh, uh, you know, e very easily managed and dump it to a database. Um, again, this, so this is online, this, uh, the Scraper framework, if you're interested. I'm very bad at naming things. Uh, so I, I call this Stack Scraper unoriginally. I, you can probably tell I name things jQuery and stupid stuff. So I mean, uh, so yeah, you can, you can find that online. You can also find all the scrapers that I've written uh, as well. Uh, if you're interested in, in Stack Scraper specifically, let me know, and I can try to document it better. <laughs> So one of the big, big things I've been doing, though, has been doing computer vision work and image similarity analysis. Um, and uh, just to show an example, uh, so the, the, one of the services I'm using here is this service called Match Engine by a company called TinEye. And uh, Match Engine allows you to do stuff like this, where given an image, it'll find all the similar looking images uh, from you know, within the corpus. Now this is super, super useful. So in the case of woodblock printing, they're prints. So there are going to be multiples of them. You know, there wasn't just a singular copy made. So what ends up happening is that, for example here, this is a, a, a print by uh, Hukusai that's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And this is the same print in many other institutions around the world. So you, you have it here in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, uh, the British Museum uh, in San Francisco, Honolulu, Tokyo, uh, Kyoto, all over. And now, th so what, what's happening here is that s be because uh, you, you, uh, you know, I'm using image analysis uh, on this, I can completely ignore all the metadata or lack of metadata that is associated with these images. Because the thing is that you know, frequently institutions, they'll, uh, 
you know, they'll say, oh, this is by this certain artist, and this is the title, but they get a lot of that wrong very frequently. Um, and that's part of what I'm trying to fix. So, so the nice thing about this is that, again, you, you end up with cases like this, where you see down here in the bottom, uh, there are even prints with like color bars in, you know, inside the image, and a black and white uh, 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 prints, uh, you know, uh, photos of the prints, and it, it's even capable of matching in those cases. Um, let's just show another example here. It's a print in the Art Institute of Chicago. And what's interesting is that this print, is, so it's, it's a diptych, it's a two panel print, and they actually put it backwards. So like the, the, each of the prints should be on the other sides, all right? And if you look, it actually matched it correctly in the Metropolitan Museum of Art down below, where they did put it in the correct order. Um, now, I mean, this, the, I can't, you can't really blame them. This sort of stuff just, just happens. You know, you're, you're taking photos, and you're like, all right, there we go, photo, done. And, um, but the nice thing is that it's, you know, this uh, uh, technology is capable of ignoring that. Where you can now be like, oh, you know, even though this is a two-panel print here, it's able to find the individual panels that are in other institutions. And again, this really, really helps scholarship. Uh, and again, it's, it's able to handle different uh, variations in color in black and white. And uh, one of the things, one of the cool features I want to show is I have the ability to take images of a print and be able to quickly toggle between them. So. Uh, just uh, this is an example. Uh, so you, you ever do like those uh, I spy things where you have two things side by side and you try to spot the differences? Like this is what print scholars do on a professional level. I kid you not. Uh, uh, because the thing is, is that if you can spot differences in a print, you can tell which edition they are, roughly speaking. Like this is this came before this. Uh, um, and so just you know just to flip through them. So these are two prints that are the same print from two different institutions. And the nice part about it, the the computer vision work is that you can uh, you can do the analysis and get back a matrix essentially saying these two portions are the same. You skew this one to match this one, and you can line them up perfectly. So I, I'm I'm using a, I'm just doing this in the browser in a canvas element. And so one, one thing you note here, I just want I want to point out. So look at the very top of the image, top of the print. See how one's missing a giant chunk, and one isn't. I mean, th that's kind of important to know that like one is actually missing about an inch, uh, and the, whereas you can see in this one that it, you know th this other this other print still has it. But again, th that's that's the sort of thing they can really only tell by starting to do this direct comparison of one print with another, and this is why it's so useful to to scholars. Um, so w one thing. Uh, one thing, oh, sorry, one thing I'll mention is that I've actually, you know, I, I've, uh, when, when I started the website, I started by scraping institutions just myself. Uh, I didn't ask for permission first, um, which is probably a good thing, because I'm sure if I had asked for permission, I never would have gotten it. Because uh, it's, it's sort of like, hey, I want to do, you know, couple, you know, tens of thousands of requests and download these massive, you know, you know, gigs and gigs of images off your server. Is that okay? And yeah, like no one's going to ever say okay to that. Um, but what's happened as a result is that the website is out there and people have been using it. And a couple of interesting things have happened as a result. One is the institutions have actually been contacting me saying how much they appreciate it. Um, they, they're, they're absolutely thrilled. Uh, that 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 I've built this, and the, the other thing is I have I now have museums coming to me and be like, how can we be a part of this? How can we be included? Because an interesting thing has happened is that, um, like, if you search for ukiyo-e or Japanese woodblock printing online, I I am number two behind Wikipedia, um, and it's like so like. Like I, now, everyone's kind of going to my site to, as like the source for this information. So they all—it's it's like one of those things. Like if if you aren't part of the database now, no one knows that you exist, which is a weird thing. But anyway, uh, so anyway, so I'm trying to be accommodating, but it's a lot of work. Uh, so, but the, one of the best features, and the reason why I made this site, was to be able to do image similarity search. And what this does is you might be familiar with this from like Google Image Search or something. Is that uh, you know there's a form of site that says search by image. You can take a photo of a print with your, with your phone or what have you, and it'll find that print in all the different institutions. Now, as I said, this, this, this is why I made this. Uh, um, because you know, if I, you're looking at this print, there, there's tons of text and, and there's details about the artist. But if I can't read them, 
then it's, it becomes really, really hard to figure out who it is and when it was by and what the print is depicting. Um, you know, there are books, for example, there are books of just uh, Japanese names, uh, uh, like signatures. Uh, there are books of nothing but publisher seals. I, I own those books, and you can just sit there and like page through them and try to figure it out. But wouldn't it be just a lot easier just to take a photo and just find the print in the institution that has already done this cataloging and research? So that's what, so that's what I did. And this is the sort of thing that has been monumentally useful, both to myself and other people, is because now it's cut the, the research time from literally uh, hours and days down to minutes, where you can just you know, take a picture, look at what the Museum of Fine Arts says, and just be done. Um, so this is something I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about and super pleased with. Um, there's one, one gotcha here with the image analysis I want to point out. So like this is a case with a, a, an image where there's like these giant color bars uh, on the side, a gradient bar and a color bar, and a root. Um, so it did correctly match the same print in other institutions. However, it then matched uh, a different print at the same institution. But it, what it was doing is, is actually matching the color bars themselves, not the image. So one of the things that I did um, is I've built this software um, for doing cropping and annotation of images. So it's, it's actually a mobile application. I'm its only user at the moment. And uh, what we can do is, uh, the, I built this for two reasons. One is to be able to crop out the prints from an image and just you know, remove the color bars and stuff like that. Uh, but also the fact that uh, when I'm, yeah, I, mean, I live in New York City, so I spend a lot of time taking the subway to different places. And that's a lot of time I'm spending not being productive. Um, so I created this cropping uh, application so that while I'm riding the subway, I can be doing something. In this case, cropping you know, Japanese bulldog print images, removing, uh, uh, removing color bars. And it's super useful. I mean, like, uh, you know, I can go through you know, a, a couple hundred uh, you know, very, very quickly. And um, so I, I've, I've been working on this tool. And I've also been doing, uh, using it for uh, starting to use it now for image annotations. Because one of the things I, I, I think would be really cool, again, this is my definition of really cool, uh, is going through every print and uh, uh, drawing a, a, a box around every single head in every print, so every depiction of a person. And I want to do essentially face recognition on these depictions of people, because the thing is that these people were actually, many of them were real people, and they were, they were using certain uh, stylistic uh, affordances to, to let you know that this was this person. And so you can do analysis on that to figure that out. But you can also figure out a lot, there's all sorts of symbolism in these prints to let you know who this person is. Um, like, you, you, like, at least from my end, like looking at this, this is a, you know, a, a absolutely a, a courtesan. You know, the way the hair is done, the way there's pins in the hair, all these sort of things. But the thing is that like, if I have thousands and thousands of these, um, what I want to be able to do is take all these little heads and have people start uh, do crowdsourcing and start cataloging them. Uh, so making little games and stuff so you can be like, oh, there's pins in the hair and there's all these sort of things. And as a result, you can start to figure out the subject matter of all these prints through reverse, essentially. Um, so uh, yeah, essentially, it's going to end up kind of being like a Facebook for like Japan in the 1820s. Uh, um, but <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Um, so I, so I've, been, I've been working on this. And as it turns out, this, this particular application is really useful uh, for other people as well. Working with uh, uh, the New York Public Library, who you'll be hearing from later. Uh, working with Mauricio on this. You know, this is the source. We want to be able to have like sort of this offline mobile experience for doing crowdsourcing. Uh, so hopefully, we'll be coming out with a nice, cool application for this sort of stuff here soon. Um, I, I, I gave a, a version of this talk recently, and afterwards, uh, a couple days later, someone emailed me, and he had done some work to make a script. Uh, which went through and actually detected some color bars and images and automatically cropped them off. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I drop in a, a link there, and if you want the, con uh, the details on it, I can email you. Um, so this is done by David Chester at uh, uh, Shutterstock in New York. And uh, so obviously this is super useful. And it, it, the, the problem that we've been hitting, so we've, we've been working on this, is that it works great for some cases, but there are lots of really, really weird cases. And those are cases where you might just have to fall back to doing it manually. Um, 
but yeah, so, the, so there are being advances uh, done in this now. Um, so one of the things I, I, I think is really cool is obviously I, you know, I built these tools for myself to be able to you know, improve my research, but I'm really interested in being able to move the study of Japanese prints forward on the whole. Like, like, you know, just be able to help researchers and help them with discovering interesting things. So I want, uh, I want to show an example here. So these, this is uh, one print. Uh, I want to toggle, I'm going to toggle back and forth here. Uh, can anyone tell me what these, it is another iSpy, right? Uh, what do you see different between these two prints? Colors. Colors? The face? Yeah. Insignia? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Patterns, I heard. Okay, so all those things are true. Um, so th you can tell, though, that a large portion of the image are the same. The leaves are the same. The, oops, sorry. The, the general uh, you know, the f you know, flow of the clothing is the same. So they're obviously very, very similar. You know, uh, uh, and this is actually getting into the dynamics of woodblock printing on the whole. So the woodblock printing, it was wood. You had a piece of wood. And what actually happened is that this particular woodblock, you know, they, they printed a whole bunch of copies of, for, in this, in this particular case, this is a kabuki actor. Um, kabuki actors, it, it was, there were uh, males depicting both males and females. Um, and I, I don't have time to get into it, but they, you, you can tell it's a male depicting a female. There's, there's the purple patch. So like all male kabuki actors were, by law, had to, they had to shave the top of their head to make them less beautiful. It's a long story. Uh, but they, 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 uh, uh, as a result, they cover up the bald patch with a little purple patch to make it look like they're more like a woman. Anyway, so um, the thing here, though, is that so this is an actor in a kabuki play. And what happened, we can assume, is that the actor probably left the role, or the role changed, or something like that. And what happened is that these physical woodblocks were then sold to another publisher. And when the other publisher got it, they then physically chopped out the head, uh, you know, because it's wood, put in a new chunk of wood, and carved in a new face of the different actor playing a different role. Um, and but it, it, what's interesting, the interesting thing about this is that you know stuff like this can be kind of hard to find uh, uh, manually. But for image analysis, this is super easy. Because like when you have 90% of the images is all the completely the same, and the only difference is the tiny head, they're like, oh, yeah, it's obviously the same. Um, I want to show another case here. Um, so just go back and forth. Uh, so, so again, like this case is, you, you can see uh, uh, everything's virtually the same except for the head. However, I also want to show this. So in the bottom right here, you have a signature. This is the signature of the artist. That was carved into the wood block as well. And if you toggle back and forth, the signature is actually different. All right. So this is a really interesting case. And as far as I can tell, this is unique. I haven't found any other cases like this, nor has any other researcher I've talked to. And this is a case where the print, the, the subject matter change, that it, it is now it's a kabuki actor, but it's a different kabuki actor. But additionally, the publisher or someone removed the signature of the artist and put in the signature of a different artist. I don't know why, nor does anyone else I've talked with so far. But this is really, really interesting because one of these prints is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The other one is in the Art Institute of Chicago. So they're by different artists depicting different actors in different plays. So there is, there is zero metadata linking these two things together. All right. It is physically impossible for any traditional means of finding these things to, to match up. So this is a case where so I, had, I built this tool. And the reason why this is covered is because of this tool. So I've been working with the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York on finding ways to improve the attributions on their prints. Uh, uh, so, so figuring out like which way. Uh, uh, yeah, it, like just an example here. So these prints on the left are all ones in the Metropolitan Museum of Art that were labeled as unknown. They did not know the artist who created them. All the ones on the right are all in different is other institutions where that other institution knew who the artist was. So again, this is like image analysis coming into work where you can be like, okay, these two things are obviously incredibly visually similar. However, the Met here says that they don't know who this artist is, whereas the other institution says it's Kuniyoshi. And in fact, you have three other institutions who all agree and say it's Kuniyoshi. But this is a case now where you can start to go back through and be like, hey, Met, let's 
update the database. And they go, let's go through and actually fix this and improve the cataloging now. Uh, and th it was through this that it was actually that I actually discovered this because these two disagreed on the name of the artist. But and I, when I went and looked at them, I'm like, wait, they're actually different prints. And uh, and so it's, it's it's interesting. But uh, again, like once you start developing this stuff, it starts to come out. Um, so a big big part of what I'm doing here is I'm aggregating this data from all these institutions, but a big part of it is correcting all the print data. Uh, there, and there are lots of mistakes. Um, I think well, one of the most challenging things straight out is the fact that there's no consistency in how Japanese names are written. Um, artists change names incredibly frequently. Uh, and then obviously in ja uh, English institutions, they write it one way. In Japanese institutions, they write it a different way. Um, all of these are valid alternate names for the same artist. In fact, I could fill multiple pages of this. Um, and it gets really, really tricky, especially when you want to start translating artist names from English into Japanese and back, uh, and from Japanese back into English. So you start to think, well, OK, if I had a good mapping, if I knew, if I always knew that uh, uh, you know, Ando was this in Japanese, and that in Japanese is always Ando, then I could just build a mapping database to go back and forth. Well, the problem becomes, though, is that Japanese and English is not a one-to-one -one mapping. OK? Uh, uh, I should also mention, this is how I'm learning Japanese, is by building these tools and figuring out these, this weirdness. Um, so for example, here we have, you have Ando. And all of these are valid ways to write Ando in Japanese. All right, So you can't go English to Japanese. I'm like, OK, well, that, that's not great. Well, can I go backwards? If I have the Japanese, can I go back to English? No, you can't. So this is, again, a version of Ando. And those are all different ways of writing the same thing in English. Um, so it is, it is a complete mess. Uh, you can't, you know, it's not easy to port these things any which way. So I've written a whole bunch of different node modules to fix this. Um, these are going to be of interest, I'm sure, to very few people. But I just want to go through them. Uh, so one of the modules I wrote was, or I, I actually, so this one already exists, and I, I worked on improving it. was called Hepburn. So there's a form of what's called a romanization, so that it taking a, a, a Japanese a, a phonetic alphabet and converting it into English and, and vice versa. So you can do stuff like this, where you convert uh, the English form of a name into the phonetic Japanese version of the name. Uh, Enomdict is this a Japanese database of Japanese names. So you, you end up with a Japanese name, uh, uh, whether it's a surname or a given name, uh, whether it's male or female, and how to read it in both, uh, and how to read it in English, which is super useful. Um, and there's also this other database called the National Diet, Li Na National Diet Library Name Authority. National Diet Library is essentially the Library of Congress for Japan. And uh, what they have is a massive database of all these different people and artists inside uh, uh, inside Japan, and you can go through and start to do mapping. So one of the things that happens as a result here is, uh, is I, when I dump it all into this one tool I wrote, uh, Romaji name, is you can take a name like this. So the, you can see the original there on the top. And so they wrote uh, Sharaku, uh, Toshusai. And the problem is, though, is that they wrote it wrong. One, they wrote the name backwards. So in, in traditional Japanese, you always write, always write the family name first and then the given name. Whereas in, in the West, we typically do a, a given name first and then a family name. And so one, that was flipped. So I had to figure out, go in and, and using the different databases, figure out which is the given and which is the uh, uh, surname. And then once I have that, start to correct sort of the phonetic uh, 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 issues with it. So you have the correct stress marks and all this sort of stuff. So this stuff really, really bothers me because like everyone messes up. And when, it adds, when I was trying to learn this stuff, uh, every single website on the internet disagrees on this. Like, like no one is consistent at all. Um, uh, uh, Wikipedia is a mess. Uh, it's, it's, there, there's, no, there's no one place you can go for this information. Um, so I'm actually in the process right now of developing uh, uh, a database of Japanese artists, which uh, uh, and so and one of the things I did as well was also fixing the parsing of Japan uh, of, of so sorry of, of dates. So like you, you know museums have this very particular way of giving a date. They'll be like 18th century, you know, 1820s. You know it's always it's fuzzy dates. It's date ranges. So it, I wrote this library for parsing these fuzzy dates and turning them into a real date range. Uh, so like that way, if you, someone says 1820s, it goes from 1820 to 1829. And that is, then I put that in a database so you can query against it. Um, 
so like as, I, as I mentioned, I, I've been working on building a database of Japanese artists. Uh, I think currently the largest database that I know of has something like, I don't know, like the largest Western database has something like 70 artists in it. Uh, I think mine's going to have about 4,000. Um, and uh, all with you know the, the names in English and Japanese, all the artists, uh, are, uh, different artists' names, when they're active, when they're alive. And one of the th hard parts about this is that when you're, I, I'm merging all these databases together, is that you have to do what's called rectification. So figuring out uh, uh, if you have two different records, which one is the right record, and if they are the same. So I actually built a tool for this, uh, so I, I can go through on the command line and look at an artist and be able to uh, make these determinations like, oh, are these the same person? Are they not? Should be, they be merged together? All this particular stuff. So in this case, you can see that you know, these two are probably the same. It's just that they disagree on the dates uh, a little bit. Uh, so to go back uh, really quickly to the, the case I, I, I showed initially here. So this was, uh, so I, you know, I, there were all these prints that came up in the auction here. So I, I was curious, and I went through, and I took one of the pictures, and I dumped it into my website. Uh, uh, and sure enough, up came particular uh, uh, prints that were in different institutions. So as a result, I was able to figure out the name of the artist, when it was printed, in this case, 1897. Uh, it sold for $550, so $550 for, for 21 prints. Um, but what the interesting thing I've discovered is that these prints individually sell for $100 to $400. Um, so that means the true estimate for this is about $2,100 to $8,400. Uh, I should say I did get these prints. Um, <laughs> and so, so yeah, exactly, this is an arbitrage case where Museums, or auction houses don't know what they have, and other people don't know what they have. <laughs> and, and so you can go through and find these edge cases. Um, so one of the things I, I, I actually do is I sometimes go to auctions and take my phone and just take pictures of the prints that are for sale. <laughs> and you can just see, and you can just be like, oh, that's that. Oh, this is a good impression. Yeah, that's worth 20 bucks. You know, like, you know, it's like, because that can be worth a lot more. And now the one major caveat here is that it is theoretically worth $2,100 to $8,400. However, you have to find someone who's willing to buy them, uh, which means I would have to essentially turn into like a woodblock dealer, uh, which is a whole other thing. Um, but for now, I just think they're fantastic prints, and I just like owning them. Um, so. Uh, uh, very, very, very quickly here, I just I want to go through and I want to talk a little bit about how I've been extending this to other art forms. I've been collaborating recently with uh, an institution in New York, the Frick Art Reference Library. Uh, it's part of the uh, museum, the Frick Collection, and the Frick Art Reference Library is one of the best uh, art, uh, uh, art history reference libraries in the world. They have, uh, uh, and they have, one of the things they have is a massive photo archive of 1.2 million photos of art so it's not art themselves, it's photos of art. And so I've been doing analysis, uh, image analysis on their collection, particularly on a, uh, a collection of anonymous Italian art. So this is all like uh, Italian, mostly Renaissance, uh, uh, and these are cases where they're all unattributed or they don't know who, who created it. And so I'm able to find all sorts of cases where, for example, you have uh, uh, this case, so, so th this is an archive, and, and these, these are photos that are literally being cataloged uh, in separate places. So in that, like, there's one photo, and one person went, oh, this looks, you know, 14th century Milan, boink. And this person, uh, sometime, you know, decades later, someone said, oh, this looks 15th century Roman, boink. And, like, and, like, the thing is that since they're unattributed, you can't, it's nearly impossible to merge these back together again, unless you have just a human going through. Um, so this is a great thing that image analysis can do. We can go through and be like, OK, these two things are way over here, but why are they? They're obviously the same thing. So I was able to do a lot of this, going through and finding cases even when the, the lighting is different, finding cases where you have one image as part of a larger image or part of a, 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 a mural, uh, cases you know, color versus black and white, you know, a, little, a segment of a much larger like fresco, and really cool cases, like cases, I, I, and as far as I'm able to determine, uh, a before and after conservation. So cases where, where uh, you know, paint had been uh, repaired or uh, things had been removed. And like really dramatic cases like this, where large chunks of this fresco had been repaired. Or it's, it's either, so this is, I mean, this is the case where scholars can go in and figure this out. Either it's, this is after repair, 
or this is after it was damaged. Um, you know, it just could have been in World War II or, or something like that. Um, and then you also spot, it's really good at spotting copies. Uh, so for example, these are two images that look very, very similar, but if you look at it, the faces are slightly different and the little globes that person's holding is different. And that's because these, both of these paintings are actually copies of a Da Vinci painting. Uh, so there, uh, you know, the, and you also have cases here where like these, um, where they look very, very similar. But again, I guess it's like frolicking babies. I always love crazy stuff. Right, so the, uh, but again, like you, you look at it, it looks very similar, but then you look, you're like, okay, there are differences here, but they're obviously inspired by each other. So but again, that's, that's a really interesting thing for scholars to be able to dig into. Another thing that I've been starting to uh, look into is I'm really interested in, like, if you have two photo archives, okay, you have the Frick, so I, one thing I've been doing is I've been working with the Frick in New York and uh, the Zuri Foundation in uh, Italy, and they both have massive photo archives. Finding ways to merge these two photo archives together using image analysis. And one of the things I've been doing is I've been doing image analysis and graph analysis. And so I've been using this tool called Neo4j. It's, it's a graph database. And I just want to show an example really quickly of the kind of queries you can do, because I think it's a really cool uh, environment. So I should say, a, a graph database, it's different from a relational database or you know, other types of databases. And it's purely uh, designed to have nodes and connections between nodes. And so you're, 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 you're querying sort of these graphs. Um, and you write these really interesting queries. So like the top one here is, is a, actually kind of like SQL. So in this case, you're finding all the nodes that is an artwork from the Frick and give, returning a dist, you know, the, the count of how many there are. However, you can do this really crazy stuff like at the bottom. So this gives all the artworks that have a connection to an image that matches another image of another artwork where that artwork is not the same as the original artwork. So this is able to find cases where it, artworks are matching new artworks. Um, and this is like a single line query. And like this, the sequel for this, that would be like four pages long. I would not want to write that. Um, and like with like 40 joins. So like that, that, is, that is way, way simpler. I, I, I kind of love it. So what interesting thing about this is you can make all these really interesting discoveries. So these are cases, like for example, the Frick has a, a one record with an image and uh, actually has, has two records with two images. However, there is no match between them. And additionally, there's the Ziri Foundation, which has three images. Now, all the images are matching each other, except the Frick isn't matching its, the other records. However, because you have this sort of, this sort of this structure, you can then deduce that the, the Frick's 420 and the Frick's 417 are actually the same thing. They're just showing different parts of it. And when you dig into it, you see that that's actually the case. They're just different photos of the same fresco, but just showing different parts of it. And then you end up with really interesting cases like this, where all these records are pointing to each other, but none of them point to ones of the same institution. And again, this is, I, I've written queries to detect this sort of thing in the graph database, where you, you're looking for these edge cases where they don't point back. And, uh, and if you look at the reason why, it's because one record has these two images and there's other two. And the other da database, they just categorize them separately. And, and, but, and, but as a result, you're able to figure out that, oh wait, all four of these images are actually the same. Um, uh, whoops. Uh, okay, so um, okay, so one thing I, I want to uh, I want to wrap up here really quickly. Uh, so one really great hack I want to say about learning art is uh, I recommend going to so there, you know there are auctions happening all the time all around the world, especially so in New York. And one of the great hacks for learning is to go to art auction previews. So you can go to a preview as just a dude on the street. You can just stroll in, and they don't card you or anything. And you can go in and look at art. Additionally, you can also touch the art, OK? Um, because so the interesting thing about this, so this is me handling a quarter million dollar print. Uh, and this is the only way you can really learn this stuff. In my case, like I want to learn about prints. And unless you own them, the only way to learn about them is to see them and handle them. And the thing is, is that even in a museum where they have something like this, the curators themselves aren't allowed to do this. Uh, you know, they're all tucked away, and, and only special handlers can handle them. So like, it's an amazing opportunity to be able to go to these previews. It's like a private exhibition. You just go in, and you're like, I can just learn and touch, and, and it is, it's fantastic. So I just want to recommend that. 
And I want to close by saying, I wrote, I wrote a blog post about this recently, but one of the things, so this is all, all my, my side projects here. And I've been working uh, on this for, for a while, but I made a decision last fall to start working on this much more aggressively. And uh, so since last uh, uh, late November, I've been working on this every single day. And this has been a big change for me. It's actually really helped me to get a lot more work done. So uh, I, I, work, I work less in general, but more consistently. So maybe only code like maybe 30 minutes a day or so. And as a result, like since November, I've gotten just so many projects done. I've done like a rewrite of a website. I built that cropping tool. I've done all sorts of like building all these other tools. And it's been really, really awesome. I definitely recommend trying this out as a strategy for improving productivity for side projects. Because at least for me, it's been a struggle trying to balance side projects with real life, with family, with friends, with work, and all these sort of things. Um, so I'll end with links. So uh, on my website, I've actually been publishing papers as well uh, about this, uh, about my research, and especially how it can aid our, our historians. So I've, I've published some papers on my website. There's the, the UQA site, and all my code is up on GitHub. And if any of this data sounds interesting to you, I will give you whatever you want to, to play around with. Uh, I would love to see cool visualizations or whatever. Yeah, just, just let me know, and I can send you just massive data dumps. Um, that's not an issue. Um, so yeah, I'll close with that. I think I have a couple minutes for, for questions, but, uh, but thank you.